Okay, so this is the second part of Possible Origins of Dianetics and Scientology. And uh, let me say the essential point is that Hubbard claimed to be the originator of all of these ideas, that nothing important had been contributed by anybody else. And that's simply not true by his own admissions, as we've seen in the first part of the paper. There are many times where there were people he was aware of who had contributed something significant, and he says that the contribution was significant. So, you know, he, he likes Freud one minute and he likes Breuer the next, but he's nonetheless saying that his techniques did come from somewhere else. The deeper question is, do they work? And um, we'll probably talk about that somewhere else, but the deeper answer is no. They don't create clears who have, you know, absolutely perfect memory and are not susceptible to viruses and are completely rational. That, that's not the state of the Scientology clears that I've met, I've yet to meet anybody, let alone the superhuman states of being able to move around the universe at will and make things appear and disappear, and basically be a magician. Um, I've never met that either, and in my experience of Scientology now goes back much farther than I'd like to think about. It's, I think, uh, 45 years. Oh. Man and boy. Okay, so part two, possible origins for Dianetics and Scientology. Authorship of Dianetic and Scientology texts. The first editions of several Hubbard books show that they were compiled or edited from his lectures or indeed written by others. In later editions, the work is attributed simply to Hubbard. The first edition of How to Live Though an Executive carries the statement, the manuscript of this book was prepared by Richard DeMille who helped in the development of the communication system herein set forth. No major contributions, though. Uh, later editions simply delete this statement and ascribe the work to Hubbard. Child Dianetics was the work of a team, but again the current edition is attributed solely to Hubbard. The Phoenix Lectures were compiled into book form by members of the Hubbard Association of Scientologists in South Africa. But only the first edition, called Notes on the Lectures Given by L. Ron Hubbard at Phoenix, 1954, acknowledges this fact. Dianetics, and the, there is in fact a difference between this original edition and later edition, bits are edited out where Hubbard said made negative comments about God. They've disappeared from the uh, later editions for some reason. Dianetics, the original thesis, was prepared for publication by Donald Rogers, to whom no acknowledgement is given. Science of Survival was prepared for publication by Richard de Milligan, to whom no acknowledgement is given. Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. Hubbard's first supposed therapy book was also a collaborative effort. Joseph Winter, MD, has left his own account of this in the book A Doctor's Report on Dianetics. Uh, see particularly pages 16 to 19. This is corroborated by my own correspondence with former Hubbard associate Donald Rogers, who contributed, where Winter contributed the introduction to the original Dynamics Mind Science Mental Health. Don Rogers produced two appendices, which were actually, I think up until 1981, were still included, so for 30 years were included in the book. That's how close, closely they were working with Hubbard. Also, the letters of John Campbell Jr., um, and Ben Corridan's interview with Hubbard's second wife, Sarah Hollister. Winter, Rogers, Campbell and Sarah Hubbard were among the original seven board members of the Hubbard Dianetic Research Foundation. These four discussed the terminology with Hubbard and the changes made by them were obvious when comparing Hubbard's first article on Dianetics, Terra Incognita the Mind, and the book Dianetics, the Original Thesis, with other works. For example, by the time Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health was published in May 1950, Hubbard accepted an existing medical term, engram, for the memory of a period of pain or unconsciousness. Hubbard said that he had previously used the terms norn, which comes from Viking mythology, comonome, which is the one I like, or impediment, which is a bit weak. I'd love to have some comonomes. According to Joseph Winter, MD, the term engram was taken from the 1936 edition of Dorland's Medical Dictionary, and it's attributed to the psychologist Richard Seaman, who we've already mentioned in part one. As far as I know, this is nowhere admitted in the literature of Dianetics and Scientology. The word engram is not original to Ron Hubbard. 
professional auditors' bulletins, the pubs of the 1950s. Many of the pubs were written by Johann Tempelhoff. However, since the late 1970s, Tempelhoff's name has been removed from all pubs. Pub 149 originally carried the legend compiled from the research material and tape lectures of Aaron Hubbard by Johann Tempelhoff. Technically, this is plagiarism in that the written work was still that of Tempelhoff, whatever the source of the ideas. The book introducing the e-meter. This booklet is currently sold as an L. Ron Hubbard work. The first edition carried this legend, photographed and compiled by Red Sharp from the lectures and demonstrations by L. Ron Hubbard. Subsequent editions simply remove Sharp's name. Photographed and compiled from the lectures and demonstrations by L. Ron Hubbard. Sharp's photographs have been recredited to Hubbard along with the text. Rocky Mountain News. In February 1983, the Rocky Mountain News published what purported to be a long interview with L. Ron Hubbard, who'd been in hiding for some time by then. In fact, Hubbard's replies were compiled by his ghostwriter, Robert Vaughan Young, a member of the Hubbard Biography Project at the time. Mission Earth. The ten volumes of this book were rewritten prior to publication by Robert Vaughan Young. Runs Technical Research and Compilations, RTRC. For many years, Hubbard recorded his thoughts in tape lectures. These were used as a source for printed issues, bulletins, policy letters, executive directives, and so forth. Hubbard gave his last public lecture in 1966. He continued to lecture occasionally to specific Scientologist audiences until 1975. From that time on, Hubbard continued to record his utterances on tape and sometime in the early 1970s, a unit initially called Ron's Technical Compilations, or RTC, came into being to compile printed issues based upon Hubbard advice tapes. With the incorporation of the Religious Technology Centre in 1981, a new initialisation was needed, so the compilations unit became Ron's Technical Research and Compilations. Ken Rose, in Los Angeles, was a member of this highly restricted unit until... November 1988. No specific acknowledgement is given to members of this unit, although the wording of issues is probably often their own. Several people were given the right to publish issues on Hubbard's behalf and using his name. The name, after all, has been owned by Scientology since the 1960s. Technically, the Board of Directors of the Church of Scientology of California could, up to 1981, when the Church of Scientology International took over, issue work purportedly from Hubbard, which Hubbard had never seen. They had the right to do this legally. David Gaiman, acting as Scientology's head of public relations, told a British government inquiry, any staff member can propose and have published a policy document. Most policy is put out under Mr Hubbard's name, no matter whom the writer. So that is the Deputy Guardian for Public Relations from 1966 to 1981, David Gaiman. Laurel Sullivan is probably most notable among these ghost authors, as she was Hubbard's personal public relations officer for some 17 years. Fellowships. There have been many unacknowledged contributors. Prior to his claim that he was the source, fellowships were awarded to Scientologists who had made a major contribution. Of course, David Mayo was such a contributor with the knots or OT5, the New Era Dianetics for Operating Thetans materials. Um, but while the court has ruled that Mayo was the co-author, the Church of Scientology still hides this fact from its members. Otto Rose was also a major contributor, working on the 1960s rehash of Dianetics and the list processors, or L's, in 1971, at $1,000 per hour at the time of writing in the 1990s. L10, L11 and L12 were the most expensive processing given by Scientology. Evans Farber claims to have first suggested the need for an acknowledgement in the cycle of communication and therefore was the originator of training routine two. Uh, his father, uh, Burton Farber, was the man who, according to Hubbard, registered the first Church of Scientology at Church of Scientology of California in February 1954. It wasn't. Hubbard actually registered Church of Scientology in Camden, New Jersey in December 1953, along with Mary Sue Hubbard and his son, Owen Hubbard Jr. But Evans' father was the son of the guy who supposedly created the first Church of Scientology. John McMaster was responsible for keeping Hubbard informed of any interesting ideas or procedures brought forward by St Hill students. McMaster was, of course, announced the world's first real clear 
1965 by Hubbard. The search and discovery procedure is based upon McMaster's own work. McMaster also claimed that the power or grade 5 materials were a gift to Hubbard from a Scientologist called Walter Hubbard who lived in Hawaii. Who knows? Ray and Pam Kemp have claimed that they suggested the drug rundown to Hubbard. Jim Dincalci seems to have been responsible for the use of Calmag, a calcium-magnesium mixture otherwise used only as a tranquilizer for sheep. <coughs> keep your sheep calm. Bill and Connie Hamilton have claimed to be the originators of the data series. Former Scientologist Ruth Minshall wrote several books about Scientology, all of which are copyrighted to Hubbard. And he got the royalties as well, according to my sources. The original version of What is Scientology was copyrighted to Hubbard, although it was, according to his claim, written by Harvey Haber. The key to life course currently sold by Scientology organisations appears to have been developed by his wife Donna Haber. It is, in fact, the policy of Scientology to ascribe all copyrights to Hubbard. See Hubbard Communications Office Policy Letter, Outstanding Copyrights and Marks, 15th of November, 1958. So already by then, he's saying, well, even if I didn't come up with the idea, I did come up with the idea. Because honesty is sanity, remember. The Oxford Capacity Analysis. The current OCA personality test is credited to Hubbard. Formerly, it was credited to Mary Sue Hubbard. This happened after Ray Kemp had refused to assign the copyright to Ron Hubbard. His test was changed very slightly to become Mary Sue Hubbard's. However, Kemp would plagiarise the test from Julius Allman's American Capacity Analysis, which in turn derives largely from the 1940s Johnson Temperament Analysis. So plagiarism upon plagiarism. The Two Terminal Universe. Hubbard credited this fundamental Scientology idea to Buckminster Fuller. In Hubbard Communication Office Policy Letter, Positioning Philosophic Theory of 30th January 1979. Positioning and survey technology. Occasionally, Hubbard was willing to admit that his work derived from other sources. So, for example, his ideas about positioning in marketing are in fact a gauche interpretation of the ideas of Rees and Trout. Um, positioning the battle for your mind. And Hubbard refers to that book in the marketing series where he talks about positioning. So he says, you know, this is where he got it from. Um, I say that it's a gauche interpretation because it does seem to be that he skim read the book, that he didn't really get what Rees and Trout was saying. I think it was Trout who was, one of them was later employed and paid half a million dollars around about 1990 to repackage Scientology and get it successful again and his suggestion was that they get rid of the uh, religion tag and he was fired but I believe he was paid half a million dollars for his advice and uh, there you go. The survey technology clearly derives from motivational research and Hubbard makes this clear by referencing Vance Packard's Hidden Persuaders which was actually an attack upon the techniques that Hubbard had borrowed. Uh, sources for Scientology during the late 1930s and the 1940s, Hubbard corresponded with and visited fellow adventure writer Arthur J. Burke's. Burke's own works share much of the philosophical basis of Hubbard's. Hubbard got into print before Burke's, but the Hubbard archive contains many copies of letters exchanged by Burke's and Hubbard. These letters, if produced, would show the extent of Hubbard's plagiarism of Burke's, but they never will be produced. Um, the, the reason the Scientology Archive has never been used. It's 30 years since I've published a detailed account of Scientology. Uh, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. In that time, they've had 30 years to rebut what I've said by producing documents from the archive. They failed to do so, which either means that the material in the archive is too embarrassing to be shared, which I strongly suspect, or that they don't have anything that will rebut what I've said. Um, as yet, not one single uh, factual utterance about Hubbard, Scientology, uh, and the history of Scientology has been successfully rebutted. And I'm surprised that they don't do this, because Scientology is a science of knowing how to know. And if you know how to know, then you know how to prove. You know how to give evidence. You know how to show that what you're saying is right. Magic symbols, ritual magic. Many of the symbols of Scientology were taken from ritual magic. Hubbard was a member of the Amok Rosicrucians in 1940. 
and performed sexual magic ceremonies with Jack Parsons, a follower of Alistair Crowley, in 1946. The Scientology Cross is very similar to the Rosicrucian and Crowley Crosses. Hubbard also used the Daleth Triangle of the Egyptian destroyer god Set as the Dianetic symbol. Um, Daleth is the door, by the way. It's the, it could be seen as the doorway between the uh, regular world in which we live and the magical world in which Aaron Hubbard lived, but maybe not. The uh, theta or theta symbol used by Scientology is the central symbol of Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis, where it denotes Thelema or the will. It is the symbol of Babylon, the Antichrist that Hubbard and Parsons tried to incarnate. The S and double triangle motif of Scientology probably derives from the black magic use of the snake symbol, the wise serpent or Satan as he's also known, combined with the deconstruction into two triangles of the Star of David, rather like hanging the Christian cross upside down to signify devil worship. This symbol, the magical hexagram, was used by Hubbard and Parsons during their attempts at incarnating the Antichrist in human form. Again, Hubbard shares the double triangle with Crowley, where the triangle stood for the Argentinum Astrum, or Silver Star, a name for Crowley's organisation prior to his takeover of the Ordo Templi Orientis, which was German in its origins, by the way. Crowley's order, oh, here we go, I'm going to say that again here. Crowley's order, the OTO, had a common origin with the Tula group, to which several members of the Nazi hierarchy belonged, including Deputy Party Chairman Rudolf Hess. I think Heinrich Himmler was also a member. The Sigrun, used by the Nazis, appears on the Scientology International Management Organization symbol, a red square enclosing a white disc and set off by four such Sigruns. The swastika of the Nazi flag has been replaced by the Scientology S and double triangle. The symbol of the Religious Technology Center is surrounded by Sigruns. As far as I can ascertain, the Sigrun is otherwise peculiar to the Nazis. So if you're watching this and you know of any other group that's used the Sigrun, outside of Scientology and the Nazis, put it in the comments below, I'd like to know. Crowley's notion of the will. The original definition of Scientology 88008, this is Hubbard, was the attainment of infinity by the reduction of the apparent infinity and power of the messed matter, energy, space, time universe to a zero for himself. So the universe will be reduced to nothing for some reason, and the increase of the apparent zero of one's own universe to an infinity for oneself. So the universe will shrink to zero and you will expand to infinity. Sounds quite painful. It can be seen that the infinity symbol stood upright makes the number eight. Well, it doesn't quite actually, because eights have a slightly smaller top than, than bottom, whereas the infinity symbol, the two compartments, the same size, but I am being pedantic at this point and you'll have to forgive me. Which is to say, the essential idea of Scientology is to raise the power of the individual's will or intention to an infinity. This aim is held in common with all magical systems. Uh, Cavendish quotes Crowley, the great work is the raising of the whole man in perfect balance to the power of infinity. That's from a book called The Magical Arts. The exercises used in the attempt to achieve this, especially those in the creation of human ability, some of which were the original OT5 course, are ritual magic disguised as therapy. Demon possession. The current OT levels, the operating Thetan levels, the upper levels where you will achieve supernatural powers, deal almost exclusively with body Thetans. OT2 prepares you for it, uh, so that OT3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 are all involved with body Thetans. And OT8 apparently tells you that you didn't need to do any of it and now you need to undo it, but I don't know. So they don't give you the money back. The current OT levels deal almost exclusively with body thetans. The idea that human beings can be infested with spirits is common to most religions. As examples, such attached spirits are called demons in Christian literature, dibuks in Jewish literature, jinn in Islamic literature, and gadons, among other names, in Tibetan literature. In the Gospel of Luke, for example, we find the following. For Jesus was ordering the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many a time it had seized him. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied. This was because so many devils had taken possession of him. 
The method used to deal with these body thetans on the new OT5 course is surprisingly similar to that employed by Chicago University professor Eugene Gendlin in his focusing. The OT5 materials were published with a very limited distribution starting in September 1978. Gendlin's book had already been published. And uh, that was, to me, quite startling because Gendlin is the successor to Carl Rogers at Chicago University. Rogers is one of the most established names in psychotherapy. And Gendlin found this way of concentrating on, you know, do you have a sensation at some place in your body and you enter into dialogue with, with that part of your body. So while he doesn't call it a body thetan at any point or a demon or spirit or anything like that, he is using a technique which, you know, as somebody who'd been through the technique and actually read all of the OT5 materials, there, there are tremendous similarities here. Quite cu curious, that one. Not actual plagiarism. I'm not, not accusing anybody of plagiarising Eugene Gandlin at that point, just in case anybody was getting upset. I don't think David Mayo did plagiarise him. And in fact, David told me that when he first used what would become OT5 on Hubbard and cured him of his winter illness, his usual winter illness, that he very rarely referred to body thetans, that um, it was the misownership of other people or the body thetans ideas that was the important bit and that got kind of shoved aside as Hubbard reconstructed everything. You know, to make something persist you have to alter it, you have to enter a lie into it or alter isness according to Hubbard. So uh, maybe that was why. E-meter. The Scientologists rely on a machine which they call the Hubbard Electropsychometer or E-meter. The title is misleading as the machine was not developed by Hubbard. Indeed, Scientology literature admits that the first such machine for use in Dianetics was built by Volney Matheson. That's in the first edition of What is Scientology from 1978, a book that disappeared in the 1980s. Later machines were designed by others, particularly Don Breeding, and E-Meter Essentials contains the following dedication to all those who have helped to develop the modern electrometer. Some form of E-Meter has actually been in use since before World War I, and in a rare early publication, Hubbard admitted that it was pretty much a lie detector, as used in police polygraphs. That's a piece called Electropsychometric Auditing 1952. There were actually a couple of times later when he called it a, a lie detector as well. And I've been told off by Scientologists for saying that, but it was Hubbard who said it was a lie detector. And not a very good one, frankly. To quote from Barbara Brown's Supermind, nothing perhaps is more poignant testimonial to the disregard of science for creative insights into the nature of man than the blindness of psychophysiology to the original observations by Carl Gustav Jung about the body's ability to reveal the unconscious mind. It was in 1904 that Jung reported his experiments with recordings of the skin's electrical activity while conducting psychological interviews. Using an old-fashioned galvanometer, he found the electrical activity in the skin changed specifically and dramatically when he asked questions that penetrated the hidden emotions of his patients. He is reported to have exclaimed, Aha! A looking glass into the unconscious. And he has said it with a kind of Swiss-German accent. Gregory Mitchell's History of the E-Meter goes into considerable detail on the subject. Um, Outward Bound, the magazine of the Dianasis Data Network. There's no issue number or date on, on this. I'm not really sure where my copy of it's gone either. This was a long time ago. Disconnection. <clears throat> Disconnection's not original to Scientology. It's not source technology. Oh, no. The practice of disconnection, whereby one individual ceases all communication with another, has been found in fundamentalist sects for many years. Indeed, the practice has been enshrined in the English language of the phrase sending to Coventry. The Amish call the practice shunning. So do the Jehovah's Witnesses. The exclusive brethren call the practice withdrawal. However, Hubbard probably took the practice from Christian science. Christian science and the suppressive person. <clears throat> Roy Wallace, PhD, in his Road to Total Freedom, the late Roy Wallace, sadly, pointed out a number of similarities between Scientology and Christian science. The most alarming of these is Mary Baker G. Eddy's malicious animal magnetism, which has great similarities to Hubbard's teaching on suppressive persons and his adoption of the fair game law and disconnection. Hubbard referred to Christian science in a 1952 lecture, a lecture 37 of the Philadelphia Doctorate course. 
He recalled writing a story ridiculing the fundamental belief of Christian science that mind generates the physical world. The story, One Was Stubborn, appeared in Astounding Science Fiction in November 1940. Of course, Scientology too has as fundamental premise considerations take rank over the mechanics of matter, energy, space and time, which is the very idea he was ridiculing in Christian science. Fair game. The invidious practice of fair game is based on medieval English law, where an individual was marked as an outlaw, or person beyond the protection of the law. Such medieval practices have long been abandoned in the civilised world, along with branding and trial by ordeal. Well, of course, we've seen branding come back in Nixium, which is a, appears to be a Scientology spin-off. Um, trial by, by ordeal? I should imagine the next generation of Scientologists will, will bring it back. Over at Motivator Sequence, this quite obviously derives from Hindu and Buddhist ideas about karma vipaka, or action and reaction. It's also a Christian belief, you reap as you have sown. Splinter Publication. Since the release of Dianetics in 1950, many Dianetic and Scientology Splinter groups have formed. A, week, a friend of mine and I counted 200 groups in 1993 that were derivative in some way. Uh, there are probably 100 more since then, maybe 200 more. These have further spread Hubbard's ideas, creating a considerable literature. Such subjects as synergetic therapy, e-therapy, humanics, dianology, ampronistics, inductivism, abilitism, the Enlightenment intensive, re-evaluation, co-counselling, skyognostics, dianesis, avatar, est, the forum now landmark trust, kenja, primal therapy, and ekankar, all derived from Dianetics and Scientology. Darfrey John also uh, dipped into Scientology. Many texts rivaling those of Hubbard have been produced in the last 40 years. To this extent, Hubbard's ideas have entered the public domain. US Navy. Hubbard also borrowed lavishly from the US Navy with uniforms and campaign ribbons, boards of fitness, and a slew of military jargon. Security guards in the US have taken to an imitation of the uniform of state troopers. So this is at Scientology places. The standard Sea Org uniform is uh, Coast Guard uniform because uh, it says inside the, the clothes. Coast Guard. I'm sorry, I looked, I read the label. Creative processing. The creative processing of Hubbard's 1952 Philadelphia doctorate course derives from the work of black magician Alistair Crowley. Crowley is mentioned three times during the course of the lectures. One of his books is recommended and Hubbard calls him my very good friend which was not in fact true. They never, neither met nor corresponded. Crowley's work also provided Hubbard with the notion of past lives, which was Crowley's expression for reincarnation. Creative processing is in fact a form of positive hallucination, which is currently disguised under the term guided visualization and is more traditionally called astral projection. Reference to the use of such techniques can also be found in the works of Alexandra David Neal, books which were popular in the 1930s. And there's probably, you know, a little bit of Madame Blavatsky in here because you couldn't really avoid her and the Theosophical Society during the first, you know, until the 1920s when uh, Judy Krishnamurti decides to, when he becomes the messiah and takes over for Annie Besant, he decides he's going to give all the money away. And I, I sort of long hoped that somebody would, you know, Ryan Hubbard or somebody would, would be the inheritor as she was in the last legal will which was in 1981 I believe. Um, later wills were notarised by David Miscavige who was not in the room so the notarizations are, are not valid. But I was hoping that Rohan would inherit all of Scientology and um, give the money back <laughs> just like Jiddu Krishnamurti gave well at least gave away the money from the Theosophical Society but it's just to say that Madame Blavatsky and Mary Baker Reddy are probably the two most influential people uh, upon you know, 20th century New Age practice. And then people like Alice Bailey, of course, and Alistair Crowley. Phrases. <clears throat> Hubbard also borrowed from George Washington, taking the phrase, the price of freedom is constant vigilance, constant willingness to fight back. There is actually some argument as to whether Washington was the first to use this phrase. But it certainly, excuse me, predates Hubbard's use of it. He simply changed the word vigilance to alertness. So his price of freedom, which is in the technical dictionary, I think it is, 
you look at price of freedom, constant alertness, constant willingness to fight back. And it actually originates in Dianetics and Modern Science of Mental Health. A definition of price of freedom. Hubbard also adopted the British slogan, the empire on which the sun never sets, and turned it into the sun never sets on Scientology. Well, it might do one day. Gradient scales. Um, Scientology 0 0.8 shows the gradient scale of the relative value of data. This was first published by Hubbard in 1951 as an appendix to Science of Survival, but it derived directly from uh, Kozybski, and it's never used again. It's one of the things that attracted me to Scientology, this idea that rather than you know, the, the will of God, polarised black and white thinking, you could come to this incredible gradient scale of rightness and wrongness with all sorts of values on it but um, I didn't see it again. Study technology. I have an unconfirmed report that study technology was lifted whole from a photography course that Hubbard was taking. Uh, I need to check on that. I think Arnie Lerma had some clues, but the thing was that he was taking the course while he was giving the lectures, and so he would talk about aspects of uh, photography, like the Rembrandt profile, things like this, while laying out these ideas and the thought is that it might have come from the Kodak Eastman home photography course somewhere we don't know look up the words make sure you've got enough physical mass to understand the components of the thing and you know have a study a proper gradient so you're not trying to take in too much at once they're, they're not revelatory ideas uh, they're not unuseful either uh, buckskin brigades Hubbard was to create a mystique around his supposed association with the Blackfoot or Pikuni Indians. He claimed to have been a blood brother at the age of two. However, prior to creating this fiction, Hubbard admitted that his information about the Blackfoot Indians came from a man he met in the 1930s. It's a Hubbard article called Search for Research, explaining how he researched his stories. Heinlein. Robert Heinlein's ideas are also very similar to Hubbard's in places. Thankfully, Heinlein put the ideas into a fictional context. Hubbard claimed a close relationship with Heinlein. Um, as far as I can tell, they did actually meet during the war. I'm told, and I've not checked, that Heinlein's diaries say that, that Hubbard had sex with Heinlein's wife and with Heinlein himself. That's material that became available after I stopped pursuing this line of inquiry. So uh, if somebody would like to add a citation, that would be great. Gestalt. Hubbard also seems to have borrowed ideas from Fritz Perl's Gestalt therapy, though it could run the other way. Perl's made positive reference to Hubbard. Um, dynamics. Hubbard's dynamics have an origin in the work of a turn-of-the-century mystic whose name escapes me at the moment, and it's escaped me ever since I've actually seen the first four dynamics printed in a book from around the beginning of the 20th century, the early 1900s. But I didn't make a note of what the book was. And the friend who had the book, when I went back to him to check this, couldn't remember it either. His collection was so vast. Uh, so somebody will turn it up. The Rehabilitation Project Force. The Rehabilitation Project Force, or RPF, appears to derive from a study of Chinese communist thought reform techniques. There are a number of parallels between the RPF, introduced by Hubbard aboard the Apollo in 1973, his ship, the Apollo, and such techniques, which were first described in detail by psychiatrist Robert Lifton in 1961. And there's a suspicion that while he was recovering from the injuries he'd sustained from a motorbike crash when he was in Queens, New York in 72-73, that he may have read Lifton's book on uh, thought reform and brainwashing in modern China. The repeated questions of Scientology processing are similar to the Zen Koan, except that the individual does not repeatedly ask the question of himself. The idea with the Zen Koan or problem is, the famous one is, what's the sound of one hand clapping? And it's, it's that, work that one out. Not one that's much used, apparently. The, you're more likely to be given Joshu's Mu, which is, uh, Mu means nothing, no thing. Uh, which is, does a dog have Buddha nature? If you answer yes or no, you lose your own Buddha nature. So this repeating a question over and over and over to get to, which is, you know, it, it's just to say that, it goes back hundreds of years. Uh, it's not rich, not old. Tibetan sources. In the 1930s, Alexandra David Neal's books about Tibet were popular in the United States, and in Europe, in France and Britain particularly. As Hubbard was inclined towards mysticism and magical practices, and as only a tiny amount of literature was available at the time, 
it seems likely that Hubbard read David Neal's books. He did, after all, join the Rosicrucians in 1940. He was later to claim, with no foundation in fact, that he had studied in Tibet, um, uh, the original edition of What is Scientology, uh, in 1978. Scientology is supposedly rooted in Hubbard's combination of Eastern mysticism and Western science. The parallels between Hubbard's ideas and those of the Tibetans are irresistible. David Neal's first book, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, was published in the US in 1932. This was followed by Initiations and Initiates in Tibet and Buddhism, Its Doctrines and Methods, which was first published in English in 1939. A summary of those ideas, Scientology holds much in common with popular books about Tibetan mysticism, published in the 1930s by Alexander David Neal. The following ideas are held in common, escape from the cycle of birth and death the definition of the spirit, exteriorization or astral travel, reincarnation, the between lives area or bardo in the Tibetan, implanting in the bardo, the idea that you're captured and stuff is put into you, that the individual is actually a composite being made up of many entities, visualization techniques, belief in telepathy, the use of techniques to bring about telepathic control of others, which is a fundamental idea in Scientology that you can control others without their consent, which I would say is unethical. The use of the triangle as a symbol, the process of clearing, the word is used. The capacity of the spirit to emit energy beams, which he would call tractor beams. The notion that reality is a hallucination held in common. Serenity is the highest human state. The assertion that belief is self-created. That being is senior to doing. The distinction between being and becoming, ideas about absolute and relative truth, the recollection of experiences in former lives, the notion of surrounding oneself with like-minded individuals, the significance of the interplay between the static and the kinetic, which is a very fundamental idea of Scientology, but it's found in these earlier books. Postulates or wishes and their power, that neither good nor evil actually exist. There's an axiom to that effect by other goodness and badness. Beautifulness and ugliness have no other basis than opinion. The overt motivator sequence, a simplified version of the Karma Vipaka concept of Buddhism. Ideas common to David Neal and Hubbard. As with Scientology, the Tibetans believe that they can escape the wheel of rebirth and the outcome of their previous actions, Karma Vipaka called the over motivator sequence in Scientology by applying a set of techniques he may cause himself to be reborn in the most agreeable conditions possible according to um, David Neal. To quote from Hubbard, not the least of the qualities of OT is personal and knowing immortality and freedom from the cycle of birth and death. That was in the Auditor magazine 19. The cycle of birth and death is a Buddhist concept more usually expressed as the cycle of death and rebirth or the Wheel of Suffering. Hubbard claimed to differ from earlier researchers in defining the spirit as the I, the basic dictionary of Dianetics and Scientology, definition of Thetan, Dianetics and Scientology technical dictionary, definition of Theta being. However, David Neal has, what is this that which continues its way after the body has become a corpse? It is a special consciousness among the several distinguished by Lamaists. The consciousness of the I, or according to another definition, the will to live. So survive, the basic principle, is found here. It's the will to live that is surviving. The popular Tibetan idea of the spirit is much the same as Scientology's Thetan. Both seem to derive from the Hindu Jiva doctrine. The large majority of unlearned Buddhists have lapsed into the old Indian doctrine which represents the jiva self periodically changing his worn out body for a new one as we cast away a worn out garment to clothe ourselves in a new. David Neal elsewhere quotes from the Hindu Bhagavad Gita just as a man pulls off his old clothing to put on new so also that which is incarnated Dehi puts off his old bodies to assume new ones. The ultimate goal of Scientology is the ability of the spirit self or Thetan to leave the body and travel at will with full perception. Dianetics and Scientology Technical Dictionary Definition of Exteriorization. This goal is found in many magical systems. In Tibet, those who supposedly have this ability are called Delogs. The Tibetans believe in an ethereal double 
capable of what is elsewhere called astral travel. During life, in a normal state, this double is closely united to the body. Nevertheless, certain circumstances may cause their separation. The double can then leave the material body and show itself in different places, or being itself invisible, it can accomplish various peregrinations or journeys. Tibetans say that those who train themselves for the purpose can affect it at will. Hubbard told his followers of the Between Lives area, where they supposedly go between incarnations. It's defined in the Dianetics and Scientology Technical Dictionary. This is the bardo of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Three levels of Hubbard's bridge relate to implants. In the earlier 1960s, in the foreword to a book written by his then follower Charles Berner, Hubbard admitted the more experienced auditor or Scientology practitioner would recognise the between lives aspect and implants. A fundamental aspect of Scientology is the belief that the human being is a composite of entities or beings, thetans or body thetans. By body thetan is meant a thetan who is stuck to another thetan or body but is not in control. Let's, um, let's have a look where that came from. That's uh, Hubbard Communications Office Bulletin Definitions, uh, Section 3, 5th of February, 1970, Issue 2. So it's from the OT3 pack. And further, what you see as a human being, a person, is not a single unit being. It is the aggregate of all these factors which you address when you seek to guide or handle the usual human being. When you are handling a human being, you are handling a composite. That's uh, actually a public bulletin called The Nature of a Being from 30th of July 1980. So it, it's quite openly admitted that the human being is not a single unit being. And that's being told to anyone. It's not in a secret text anywhere. You are not alone. There are loads of you in there. Most of Scientology's esoteric teachings deal with supposed indwelling spirits or demon possession in Christian terms. This belief in indwelling spirits has an origin with Tibetans. Animals have several consciousnesses, just as we have ourselves, and as it also happens in our case, these consciousnesses do not all follow the same road after death. A living being is an assemblage, not a unity. And that's from Modern Management Technology. Define sustained attention, perspicacious investigation will show us that we are not a unit but a plurality, that we shelter temporarily guests of varying origins come from all points of the universe and as the lengthy consequences of intermingled causes and effects, the Buddhist is exhorted to discern the nature of the elements which make up what he calls his self. He is encouraged to follow up as far as possible the line of causes and effects which have contributed to the constitution of these elements and have led to their momentary union. Buddhists are recommended to watch with sustained attention the behaviour of these diverse elements. In truth, each supposed ego is a meeting place where jostles about a crowd that comes and goes continually by many roads, for members of this crowd are constantly on the move to join other crowds at other meeting places of universal life. There you go. The Tibetans call these indwelling spirits or demons gadons. I have been told by Tibetan Buddhists that they have other terms for them as well. Tibetans also use visualisation techniques, also called guided fantasy or induced positive hallucination, which Hubbard called creative processing during his Philadelphia doctorate course. And of course, as we've seen, Alistair Crowley also used such uh, visualisations. In the original Operating Phaeton Section 7 course, which was withdrawn in the early 1980s, Scientologists were given exercises which should supposedly lead to the ability to implant thoughts into another person's mind, which is a bit naughty, really. Scientologists believe that they will ultimately be capable of psychic feats, including telepathy and telepathic control of others, the aim of all forms of black magic. Practices with similar ends are described by David Neal. And it should be said that she was, uh, she's an astonishing woman who spent a long time in Tibet in the 1930s, French woman. And she was herself, in fact, a Theravadin Buddhist, not a Mahayana Buddhist like the Tibetans. But she, she was very insightful. She was an incredibly intelligent woman. Her books are fascinating. 
Hubbard's use of a triangle as a symbol of Dianetics can be explained by the common use of this symbol to denote black magic, also true in the Crowley system practiced by Hubbard in 1946. The word ki means a circle. Nevertheless, among the numberless forms of ki there exist square and quadrangular forms, while those used in black magic or for the coercion or destruction of malignant entities are triangular. I think that comes from Alexandra David Neal's books. But my own notes are a little unclear at this point. A central aspect of Dianetics and Scientology is the notion of clearing, which supposedly comes from an analogy with a calculating machine with a held down number which interferes with all calculations. Uh, not actually a computer, but a calculator, that's what your mind is. The held down number is cleared, so that the machine once more functions accurately. Clearing is achieved through the application of processors. However, David Neal too spoke of the process of clearing. Hubbard asserted that the being, spirit or Thetan is capable of transmitting pure energy in the form of tractor and pressor beams. This too is an aspect of Tibetan teaching. Mystic masters affirm that by the means of such concentration of mind, waves of energy are produced. Hubbard asserted that reality is the agreed upon apparency of existence, which is the 26th axiom of Scientology, and considerations take rank over the mechanics of space, energy and time. It is conceived that space, energy and time are themselves broadly agreed upon considerations, that so many minds agree brings about reality in the form of space, energy and time. That's from Scientology 0 0.8, page 27 in the I think 1968 edition I have. Further, reality, that agreement upon illusion which became the messed matter, energy, space, time universe, uh, reality is defined as that agreement upon illusion which became the matter, energy, space, and time universe, uh, from Scientology 8, 8008, page 133. This is the doctrine of illusion. In Tibet, the learned adepts of the Dzogchen sect regard the world as a pure mirage which we ourselves produce and which has no sort of existence outside ourselves. All we see, all that we feel, is identical with that which we see and feel in our dreams. Uh, from Alexandra David Neal's Buddhism. The Bodhisattva practically exercises his compassion when he has freed himself from the illusion which creates belief in the reality of the world as we perceive it. And again, like vision seen in a dream, so we must regard all things. For intellectual Buddhists of the Mahayana school, the world is not the dream of some fabled Brahma, the god Brahma, but our own dream. Each one of us fabricates continuously in his spirit images of the world with its many aspects which, so it seems to him, surrounds him and in which he sees himself playing a part, as he may do in a dream. The world is not outside us, but in us. Scientology holds that the highest state is serenity of beingness, which is taken from the tone scale and form, which once again is held in common with Buddhism. The model he sets before the disciple is the calm figure of the Arhan, who has attained immovable serenity of mind. The what's true for you is true idea which Hubbard ascribed to the Buddha, story of Dianetics and Scientology tape lecture 1958, appears in David Neal as be your own guide and your own torch, which I think we've already mentioned. The Tibetans also speak of the seniority of being to doing, an essential theme in Hubbard's work. Buddhist doctrine makes a clear distinction between being and becoming. The Sanskrit bhava and the Tibetan sipa or sripa connote existence in the sense of becoming. The Sanskrit sat and the Tibetan yu or yod connote existence in the absolute sense of being. With Hubbard, this becomes there is beingness, but man believes there is only becomingness. Uh, Scientology 08, factor number 27. Hubbard asserts that space, time and energy become be, have and do. Space could be said to be be. Journal of Scientology, 1952. And in life experience, space becomes beingness. Journal of Scientology, 1954. David Neal has, as the mind possesses no independent existence, no true self, we must know that it is like space itself. Hubbard asserted that absolute truth is unknowable. Uh, logic number six, absolutes are unobtainable. 
Logic number seven, corollary, any datum has only relative truth. This too reflects one of David Neal's texts. We must distinguish, they say, two sorts of truth, relative and absolute. Of these two kinds, only the former, relative truth, is accessible to us. Buddhism contains a belief in reincarnation. David Neal says, Buddhists are often heard to speak of the memory which an individual may retain concerning his former incarnations. Dianetics and Scientology both depend upon the supposed recollection of former incarnations or past lives. This is termed whole track recall by Scientologists. David Neal has seek friends who share your beliefs and habits and in whom you can put your trust and avoid the friends, companions, relatives or disciples whose company injures your peace of mind or your spiritual growth. Hubbard has acquisitional proximity of matter, energy or organisms which assist the survival of an organism, increase the survival potentials of an organism and acquisitional proximity of matter, energy or organisms which inhibit the survival of an organism decrease its survival potential. Those are dynetic axioms 157 and 158, if you're curious. Hubbard shares the Tibetans' concern for the interplay of the static and the kinetic, which for me was very important in my induction into Scientology. Uh, that's in Dianetic Axioms 34 and 36. David Neal quotes from a sutra, By rubbing two sticks against each other, fire is produced, and by the fire born of them, both sticks are consumed. Likewise, by the intelligence born of them, the couple formed by the motionless and by the moving, and the observer who considers their duality are alike consumed. And no mistake. The Hubbard notion of postulates can also be found in David Neal. Wishes or vows in Tibetan, mulam, smunlam, and in Sanskrit, pranidana, occupy in Buddhism a place analogous to that of prayers in theistic religions. Buddhists do not pray, they wish, and in general they believe that if the mental power of him who expresses the wish is sufficiently intense, such a wish acquires proficiency and produces the realisation of the result desired. Hubbard has absolute good and evil do not exist in the messed matter, energy, space and time universe, which is the 188th axiom of Dianetics. And goodness and badness, beautifulness and ugliness are alike considerations and have no other basis in opinion. I hope I got that right when I remembered it earlier. That's axiom 31 in Scientology. So goodness and badness are considerations and have no other basis than opinion. How you set up any ethical system from that premise, I'm not quite sure. Uh, saying that it's pro or anti-survival doesn't seem to resolve the problem because uh, what may be pro or anti your survival may be anti or pro survival for somebody else. So you can't define it as good or bad, uh, save that you're surviving. David Neal has, it would be imprudent they, the Tibetan intelligentsia, hold, to reveal indiscriminately to one and all that really there is neither good nor evil, that both are but conventions of a relative character. You'll find the same thought in Alistair Crowley, of course. Hubbard taught a simplified version of the Hindu and Buddhist doctrine of Karma Vipaka, literally action and reaction, with his overt motivator sequence. David Neal, man is dependent on the general karman, or karma, of humanity, and he is also dependent on the cosmic karma. If a man finds himself caught in the midst of a war, or an epidemic of plague, or if a cataclysm such as an earthquake occurs in the place where he is living, the sequence of his own deeds, and perhaps his character, will be altered by these circumstances. Some will say that past deeds have led the man to be born in the place where these calamities were going to happen, or perhaps to move to it if the place of his birth was destined to be immune to such troubles. And that is where, um, precipitately, this paper ended. The point is really very simple, that Ron Hubbard makes categorical statements that he is the only source of Scientology, that there are no significant ideas that come from other places. My task in writing this paper, I had Jeff Jacobson's extremely good work um, already, and I was trying, you know, when I'm talking about this material, to to reference Jeff's remarkable work. But what Jeff was looking for was places where um, Hubbard had used an idea that 
existed previously, that had been expressed previously. I was concerned to add to that where possible a demonstration that Hubbard was aware of the prior source. So he was aware of Alistair Crowley. So when he talks about past lives or, or uses closed-eyed version of training routine zero, or, or he talks about birth as significant things, we know he'd read Crowley. And in the same way, his references to Korzybski, to Freud, to Breuer, to various other people, we know that he'd read them. I'm going out on a limb a little bit in talking about Tibetan Buddhism because I can't find a connection beyond his insistence, which, as I say, only exists in one place that I know of, that he had studied with gurus in Tibet. Now, it just struck me in reading through David Neal's literature and various other Tibetan Buddhist texts, uh, Terry Clifford's um, Tibetan Buddhist medicine and psychiatry was a very important source to me. It just struck me that there were so many similarities. And if you, know, if you look to the Phoenix Lectures, Hubbard claims that Buddhism is fundamental. He talks about elsewhere about the Buddha having possibly a, achieved the state of release, uh, a state prior to clear. Elsewhere he talks about him possibly having been clear. Um, there seems to be a, a need to say that his ideas are the union of Western science. We know he didn't really study Western science in any depth. And Eastern guru ideas, and we know that he didn't study them in any depth. So it just seemed interesting to compare these these. Uh, two sets of ideas. So thank you very much for um, lending your time to me and I uh, hope to see you again soon. I'm John Atek. <laughs>